All right, guys, this is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and today I got a, a guest, Kyle Williams, a fellow Challenge member, Tim Challenge member, and I've seen his whole progression throughout the past few years, and uh, it's, it's been pretty inspiring to see him come up from, you know, just like, you know, just the whole chart going super parabolic. I don't even know how to describe that. You know, I was like, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and he trades similar, at least I maybe used to trade he, he trades differently now probably but like he, he used to short sell um more more frequently and like doing the whole the strategies that i was doing at the at the time so like it's cool to see him progress and like have similar patterns that i can relate to and and uh i decided to reach out to him and see what he's up to these days and, and you know just pick his brain a little bit so here we are so um so kyle what's up man how are you doing hey how's it going thanks for having me on it's cool yeah absolutely man um all right. So first it's just general questions, you know, in case the listeners, they don't know, they, they are not aware. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, so like, where are you from? How you got started? Um, like some, a background? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm born and raised in um, Southwest California, um, to specifically San Diego. Um, I was a, so then how I got like started in trading. Um, I was a sophomore in college. Um was an engineering major because that's what my dad did. Um, or he was an engineer and I was good at math. So like it kind of came naturally came more easily. Um, but I knew pretty much right away that I didn't want to do that as a career. Um, which wasn't for me. It wasn't something I was into, but I didn't know what to switch to. Um, I didn't want to just start jumping around, switch my majors four or five times. You know, I wanted to try to pick something that I was going to stick with. Um, and so randomly like, uh, on one night I watched the movie, the big short, um, have you seen it, David? Yeah, yeah, I, I saw it, and I have the audio book. Okay, wow, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Unfortunately, I haven't read the book, but I saw the movie, and when I first saw, it, I had, like no idea what anyone was talking about, like turning more money into more money. Like I don't know what that means. Like, and there's like the, all these terms that go on in the movie. Um, if you don't know how the markets work, and so I was like completely new, knew nothing. Um, but I knew whatever it is they were doing, like I was interested. Um, and so a couple months kind of pass. And I finally realized, oh, they're trading, like they're, they're slash investing slash trading. Um, and so that's when I kind of took a deep dive into Google, um, read some books. And then I found out everything I found when I was searching, like everything about penny stocks had like this disclaimer with it, like they're riskier. Um, you shouldn't even touch them. And I, and I, and I, the curious part of me was like, well, why, you know, to me, they're just lower price stocks. Um, and so I Googled penny stocks, and back then that was like, you know, the face of, of, of Tim Sykes, like, I mean, even now, but back then, I mean, yeah. you really like penny stocks and Tim were like the same thing. Um, so, uh, that's how I got, you know, first advertised or first shown Tim Sykes. Um, at first, I think like most people skeptical, I was like, who's this guy with the, the Lamborghinis and the Ferraris back then. Um, but I watched enough YouTube videos. I was like, okay, this guy actually does trade, whether it's penny stocks or, or, or not like he does trade and, um, and I want to give it a shot. So in about June, 2016, I did sign up for the challenge. Um, I've been in the challenge since, um, took me about maybe two to three years to actually, not two to three, about two years total to finally like turn the corner green between all of like the, the education expenses, the software expenses, um, the, the first initial losses in the beginning. Um, but since that point onward, um, I've, I've thankfully been profitable and, uh, and you know, growing exponentially. So it's really, really cool. Sick. All right. So that was 2016. So you were in college? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I joined the challenge when my in my sophomore, I guess sophomore going into senior or junior um uh summer. Yeah, yeah. Summertime then. So okay, so like how how did you balance like studying and going to school? Like how many hours would you put into it? Because you know, I asked because like a lot of newbies ask me uh like how much time and I I put a, a lot of time and when I got serious later on, like uh Actually, I, I became serious after the challenge, like a year and a half into it, when I realized I got to clean up, I got to organize my life to have a lot of time to study because it's, it's going right. to take occupy a lot of time. So, like, how did you uh, like manage the college and like the time to study and watch the markets? So um, it's so funny when I look back at it, because I was I was a I was a really good student um, prior to it. Like my best my best GPA was like the first or second semester of college, just because I've always been someone who likes to you know, when I commit to something, I want to try to do it well, at least. Um, but when I, when I found trading, I pretty much, it was like, okay, this, I, I very quickly realized how much time it was going to take. And then from there I thought to myself, okay, well, how am I going to make this happen? Right. Like, how am I going to juggle everything? 
Um, and I pretty much, well, one is I, I changed majors. So I went from engineering to finance. Um, and finance wasn't an easy major, but compared to engineering, I had, I was going to have to take like five or six classes a semester versus finance. I actually, they gave me, it was less units to, to graduate. So I, I, I could take less classes. I was only taking about four or five, um, a semester, mostly a four. Um, and then from there, I pretty much went from get a good GPA to C's get degrees. I mean, I really, I really yeah. was able to, um, tone it down to a point where I, I kind of knew how much I, how, how little effort I could put in to still pass. Um, and I didn't get all C's. I definitely got B's and A's here and there, but just if, if I knew there was a class that I could kind of just put on the back burner and give me an extra hour or two a day to then study for trading. Um, I definitely did that. Um, so that's, that, I mean, I just totally sacrificed, you know, my college educa- education as bad as it sounds. So, so, so you saw the opportunity with this and you decided, okay, I'm going to go with the, uh, trading. Yeah. Really yeah. I, and I also, I quickly learned that like, even though I switched my major to finance, it wasn't gonna. It wasn't gonna help me specifically with the skill set of trading. Um, you know, the finance degree, at least that I went to, was more about like corporate finance, like being a corporate employee and, and managing a finances of like a company, which is like nothing to do with trading. Um, at least per- personal retail trading. So I quickly knew that if I, it's kind of was like, even though I picked finance to try to parallel my route of trading, it was still either like this or that. It was like I'm either gonna make training work, or I'm going to go into the corporate field as a finance degree. Like they were so, they were too separate to be anything similar. Um, so I kind of knew it's like, if I'm going to commit to something, I need to go all in. Otherwise I'm, I'm leaving the chances smaller of not succeeding, you know? So, yeah. Um, I remember in one, I think it was in a podcast or some interview you did on, on YouTube or something. You mentioned like, okay, you weren't really concerned too, you, too much about like, you know, the Lambos or the getting rich quick or whatever that you're okay with like getting $200 a day in the beginning or something like that. And like, you're cool with that, you know? Yeah. You, yeah. So how did you approach that? Um, that's something when I look back, I, I'm very happy. I did. Um, I, I'm naturally a, a patient person, even before trading, just in terms of like, whether it be waiting in lines or like anything, I was no a naturally a patient person. Um, and of course I, I definitely, I definitely had the expectations high when I first started trading. I definitely thought like, Oh, I'm going to be rich immediately you know, after a few months, two or three months went by, I realized that's not the case. And I kind of went back to then me being patient, me realizing that this is going to take some time. Um, and so, yeah, for me, and, and like I said, because I, because I kind of now fully committed to trading and knowing that now there's really no plan B, like, even though, yes, I'm going to get my degree still, I was so obsessed with trading. I didn't really, I didn't, the thought of me actually then taking that corporate route wasn't even really an option in my brain. I knew it was a very, it was a, like a last attempt safety net. But in my head, I'm like, no, no, trading is it. So when I did that, I'm like thinking, I have to really just make this work as best I can, whether it means just surviving. Like it, it you know, I, I got to make it work somehow. And if, if it means making only 50,000 or 40,000 a year, um, or even 30,000 a year, if it, made, if it made me enough just to survive and keep doing it and giving me that chance to then maybe succeed bigger, longer, longer term, than having to like completely throw in the towel and and get a nine to five and then not be able to trade during market hours. Um, I was just trying to j- just the bare minimum, like what's the not, not to not to not to push myself to be better than that, but I was like, what's the absolute like minimum I can do just to make sure I I get this working and to avoid right the plan B of of using my degree and a way to look at it. So. Yeah, that, that was a great mindset um, going into it. That's why, you know, I asked to bring it up because I think it's very helpful for people to hear that um, oh, now. OK, so another thing. So you started with like a low amount and you started with below PDT, right? So you earned your your the privilege to trade above beat PDT. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I started with a six thousand dollar E-Trade account and. Yeah, I love that you say like the privilege because it's like in some ways many people start over PDT and that's totally fine. Um, but there's definitely there's definitely this like level of like earned I wouldn't say credibility, but just um, there's there's it's like I, I just the only thing I think is earned like there's just a certain way that like you almost you kind of have to earn size in a way like ter- in terms of like developing your skills. So like just because maybe you start with 50k or 100k doesn't necessarily mean you can handle it. And some people can. Some people are very gifted when they first start, and that's great. Um, but for me, looking back, it, it did it did slow my my progression down um, in terms of like once I got profitable, I probably could have funded over PDT and grown quicker. But in hindsight, I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I kind of really um, 
just really built that first and foremost foundation of what it meant to take a good trade versus just trading because I could, um, you know, I, I don't know if the, the PET rule is like a perfect science, like who just makes up, like you can only use three day trades per five day ruling period. I'm sure there's a better, a better law that could be put in place to determine how much you're, you can afford to day trade or not. Um, but in a way I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it because it, le- it taught me how to like, you know, what setups are worth a trade, right? What, what setups am I even worth using a day trade on? Cause even now being over PDT, I still do that. I, I won't necessarily ask myself what, tra- what talks are worth a trade, but I'll definitely like think to myself, is this a, is this a setup I trade? Is this a quality setup that's worth me putting money on the line? Cause if it's not, I'm just trading to trade. And it's like, no one, that's how you lose money long-term. So it definitely molded me early on um, for the better, for sure. Absolutely. So, so, okay. So when you were, when you were profitable, was still under PDT, like how much did you have to hold back not to fund it? Cause like, I'm sure there's a lot of trades that like you want to be in and out of, you know, and you have yeah. to like be, you have to still stick to that precision of, of, uh, you know, just the one shot, a one shot, one mm-hmm. kill kind of thing. So, so what helped a lot was definitely funding multiple accounts. Um, so I did, I did, I ended up, okay. so I started my E-Trade account. Um, but I ended up also funding a IB account. So I ended up having two accounts um, to grow it to BDT. And once, once both accounts were up to 25,000, that's when I funded it all into IB. Um, I think it also depends on what broker you use um, because I agree it's frustrating when you only have one shot, one kill um, or one in one out. And E-Trade is like that. You got one in one out, even if you partially fill. If you, I, feel, I learned this about E-Trade. I almost got the 90 day restriction like, and it might be it might be different now, but so check with E-Trade. But when I use E-Trade under PDT, it was like if you partially filled and then change your order to fully fill, like that was two day trades. That was two buys. And the moment you sold, that was two day trades. That 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 I that caught me off guard. Um, but at Interactive Brokers, IB, they're way more flexible. You can like buy, 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 and then sell, sell, sell. As long as you don't have a buy sell, as long as you have as, you can have as many buys as you want, as many sells as you want, as long as they follow each other. You know, as long as they're not, you know, a buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. Um, all the buys and all the sales after can, can be counted as a one day trade by them. Um, so once I learned that, that gave me like a huge sense of relief. And that's why IB ultimately became my main broker at the time. Um, because even though, yes, I was only having three day, tra- day, tra- day trades per week. Um, when a setup came along that I thought was worth it, I was able to kind of scale in and scale out. I wasn't so much restricted on the, the one entry and the one exit per se. So. Awesome. Okay. Um, and uh, early on, what did you focus on? Because I know the challenge, uh, it focused like on OTCs first. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I'm pretty sure at the time, I know I was, I started around the same time you did. Um, you see Gritani was short selling, you see Ducks short selling. And, you know, you can't do that because you have a, a B, below PDT. <laughs> and so, yeah. so like, what did you, what did you decide to focus on? And what was, what was your near term or long term goal? To, you know, um, so, so when I first started, um, I didn't really know what bias I had really. I mean, I was pretty, pretty open to either shorting or, or longing, um, initially more longing just cause I, I, that's like what, you know, each trade account, that's literally what it's made for. Um, however, I be led once I, once I learned about six to eight months in or about damn about more like 10 months in, um, to the first year I learned interactive brokers, let me short sell, um, OTCs. Um, and like you said, with the challenge, like you kind of are, you're in a way you're kind of groomed, um, at least OTCs look more, look more appealing for a newer trader, at least, um, at least from the challenges perspective. Um, so I didn't learn short selling till my second setup with IB. What I first learned with E-Trade was, um, the OTC panic dip buy, um, Tim loves that setup. I, I, and it's funny, he's so much more bigger on it now than he was back then, um, not that wasn't a setup that he played. I mean, he's, he's always loved dip buys, but I remember back then learning that OTC setup specifically with like that Fannie Mae. Um, if you know the, if you know the chart, like the, 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 the I think it was the day that like bow made over, over seven figures on it, where it just like that huge, like 30 minutes of green, almost like an hour, hour and a half of red. Yeah. And then like a huge, massive, like 50% bounce of like 30 minutes of green. And when I learned that chart, I was like, Oh crap. Like these are the kind of panics I should look for. Like, obviously that Fannie Mae panic is like the, the top of all top of, of plays. Like you're not going to get something that perfect. Um, but if you see an OTC panic in a similar manner, like a, a bounce is very likely. Um, and then I started tracking it through like setups or through on Excel, um, 
learned that like it had about like a high 60s win rate, at least how I was playing them and what I, what particular panics I was recording. Um, so from then I started small size. Um, eventually I, I worked out of being red. I got to break even on the setup. Then I started actually making good risk reward, um, like actual trades from the setup. So for about a month or two, I'd actually been profitable dip buying. And then this is around the time I learned IB allows me to short OTCs. So that's when I funded the IB account. Um, I realized that the panic dip buys that I was buying were coming from stocks that were already up four or five green days in a row. So I thought to myself, if I could figure out how to short them before they panic or as they're panicking, cover and then dip buy, like that's now I can add that a second setup to my arsenal. Um, and so that's essentially what I did. I learned to start short selling IB, which short the panics and then quick enough, immediately flip over to um, each rate and then long, long the, uh, the bounce. So, wow. Okay. So you were shorting and longing pretty early on. Yeah. 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 Yes. So how long did you do that for or focus on um, that? So that was, this was around, so this is about a year in now at this point, by the time I now have figured out to short sell, at least the, those panics and then dip by those panics, this was a almost exactly a year now. So my challenge, my first year in the challenge is over. It's now summer 2017. Um, and those two setups from that midsummer all the way up to December, um, I th- pretty much yeah got me back to um, to break even. So I was the most I was down about forty three hundred ish. So I made forty three hundred between um, June twenty seventeen and then December twenty seventeen. So that, that like six month period or so, six seven month period, um, I just used those two setups to really kind of grow my account back um, to break even. So to break even and um and. So when you were negative 40, 40 something hundred, yeah. Um, you, what was your biggest loss? Cause you, you don't, you know, you have really tight risk. Yeah. Um, that was another thing I did really well was I, I learned very quickly that, you know, with a $6,000 each account, when I first started, I can't afford to, to lose even $200 at a time. Like it's gotta be under a hundred. Um, and I learned that by my biggest loss. I, so this must've been maybe the first month of me actually trading, I I got lucky on like some some listed long. I just I long some listed long after hours. Um, it had news, and I I'm t- I'm totally gambling. I had no idea what I was doing, so but it, it after works. Hours. Okay. Yeah, I remember lo- I remember longing in after hours, which I have no idea why. Like it's I, I don't <laughs> I do that I don't do that at all anymore. Um, but I did it, and then you know I think it was Monday morning comes along, and the stock's up like twenty more twenty percent. I sell right out the open. And I made like like four hundred bucks, four hundred and sixty bucks. And I was like, I was like, holy crap, this is huge, this is awesome. Um, and then I think literally two to three days later, I ended up buying um, some OTC runner, and I bought it on like day three or four, green days in a row. And then I literally got caught in the panic. I mean, I, I think I pretty much bought the top of what I think it was like ticker. It's not even a ticker anymore. I think it was ESSI. I'm sure. I think I don't, I don't even think it's a ticker anymore. But I bought it on like day three or four, and the moment I bought, the panic started. And, and this is when I like still learning OTCs. So like I'm trying to sell and it keeps panicking. Right. And I, you know, if you don't, if you don't try to sell like well below the best bid, you're not going to get filled. And I kept trying to hit the bid as if like it was still like yeah. listed. Um, and so I totally just butchered it watching my, my, I put like a thousand dollars into it, but I mean, I, I lost like all my probably 40, 50%. I just kept watching it panic and panic and panic and couldn't get out. Finally, I get out and I pretty much gave back my, my $400 that I just made. Um, so once that hit me, I was like, Oh crap. Like I can't, I can't trade like this. Um, yeah. so that was my biggest loss in that drawdown that really hit me. I was like, yeah, we can't, we got to lose 40, 50 bucks at a time, you know, really can't be over a hundred at worst. So, yeah. So, um, how many setups did you, were, were you trading back then? Or like, were you experimenting? Were you experiment? Like, how did, did you track it? Like how many, cause you, okay. So right now you described buying an after hours play that's listed because otc doesn't trade after hours mm-hmm. it's talking about shorting an otc buying the dip uh so how many setups did you did you have so so that was my that was probably the biggest reason why i kind of drew down the, the about the four grand or so was because when i was when i was experimenting it wasn't it wasn't um efficient experimenting i mean it was really like like you I you would call it buy buying maybe a strong stock with news after hours I didn't call it that back then. I was like, I'm going to buy this stock because I think it's going up. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have nearly yeah, we all do that, yeah. in terms of, say it again, what's up? Yeah, we all do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and so the first six months, unfortunately, was me just kind of like, I'm going to buy this because I think it goes up. Like there was yeah. no, there wasn't enough structure. And so once I kind of, once reality hit, 
And I was like, no, 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 I need, I need more structure here. That's when I realized, okay, like what is a setup? That's why I kind of, I almost started to conceptualize like, what is a setup to me? Like, what does that mean? And that's when I realized like, okay, it has to have these minutes, it has to have, you know, X amount of criteria. It has to be repeatable this many times a year, or it has to look this certain way. And finally, once I kind of nailed that down and like, this is how I need to do it. That's kind of when, you know, things lined in place. And I, I found like, or I, I'd become aware of like the OTC dip buy. I'm like, okay, this is, a, this is a setup. This isn't just something I'm hoping goes up if I buy it. Um, so, and in many ways, like I, so you can almost say like that was my tuition in a way of like, I wasn't really tinkering with any one particular setup until the panic dip buy. That was like my tuition and just realizing a setup is how I had to do it. Um, and I just maybe kind of got lucky or, or I paid enough tuition if you want to think about that way to the markets of like, all right, we'll get, you know, he, he screwed up for six months straight, not even looking at a step. We'll give him a setup that works kind of thing. So it worked out. It worked out well that way. Great. Um, all right. So, so how did journaling uh, factor into that? Did you like journal? Did you use anything like trader view or trader sync, or did you manually do it through Excel or yeah. How'd you go about that? Yeah, I, um, I, there was a, there's a blog post by Michael Good. Um, it's like how to, so it's good. His, his blog post is, uh, or his blog is goodtrades.com. I think, um, first it's like the first time on Google, if you pop it in, but then the, the blog is like how to track your trades and it's a short blog post, but there's a video and I watched the video and it really broke it down very simply of like on Excel, you want to track six or seven different things about the trade, like the entry, the exit, the ticker, maybe the, the, the sector it's in or the news it had. Um, whether you're long or short, how many how many shares you took, just very basic. And so once I saw that, I was like, oh, I definitely want to track this way. Um, I'd always been a fan of Excel. At the time, I didn't even realize there was other like softwares that would track for you. Um, and even to this day, I'm still I still use Excel. I, I just it's the way I started. It's the way I feel most comfortable with. Um, but over time, that journal grew into more. So it first started with me tracking like five things: like long, short, ticker, entry, exit, size, you know, or and profit. As I kind of got more um, into into the pits of like how elaborate trading can get, I started tracking. Okay, what exchange is it? Um, what sector was it in? Like, what setup was it? Um, you know, and then I would start really journaling in terms of like, okay, what did I do right in the trade? What did I do wrong in the trade? Um, how can I continue doing the things I would do right? How would I prevent the things from doing wrong? Um, any particular special notes about like this particular setup did this, like this was different or this market um, environment is changing. So I have all these notes like in these Excel um, little boxes next to the trade, just like really writing it out. Um, and then I'd also screenshot the trade. Um, so that way, like even now I can go back to like trades I've taken in like 2018 or as early as like 2017. And I can just click on the, the little picture. And I'm like, oh, I took this trade, you know, four years ago. Um, so that's helped a lot taking pictures and then writing notes about how I feel or what happened in the trade. So, man, that's awesome. Okay. So when did, when did you start doing that? Like to the point where everything became clear, you know, like all those things, different things to track, like when it became super clear what you need to do. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, it was, it was definitely a slow, gradual process. It wasn't like, you know, like I said, it wasn't like I found that blog post and all of a sudden I just had this, this, this trading journal that's like full and complete. I mean, it was almost like for the first, for the first two years, maybe I kept adding more to it. I'm like, Oh, I want to add this or, and, or in terms of like tracking, Oh, I want to track this setup or I want to track that setup. And then that's when I started tracking like monthly wise, like, Oh, I want to make a calendar that lets me see my month. Um, in terms of like trying to figure out how to prevent what to do wrong. That's how I tried to realize, like I had a little, I have a little like rules column, like what are these are the rules I want to follow. Like I um, put built, built, that rule list built slowly over time. Um, so I don't know if there was an exact moment, but I would say at least a year or two in, I finally like built this, this journal or this Excel file that fit my personality and what, how I wanted to refine my process over and over and over. Um, and I think, it, I think it came to the point, well, to, to, to give more context or more detail, that little, that little section where I said, like what you do right and what you do wrong, how can you continue what you did wrong or what you did right? Um, I got that from, I think it was the daily trading coach from by mm -hmm. Dr. Brett Steenbarger. One of his, because like it has a hundred tips in it. One of the tips was like, re like reflect on your trades. And it was literally what you did right, what you did wrong. How can you continue what you did right? And how can you prevent what you did wrong? Um, so once I figured that out, that like was a light bulb for me. And I was like, oh, I need, I definitely need to put that in my journal um, or in my Excel. So I did that. And that's probably one of the last things, the last final touches on it that really allowed me 
um, to, to grow, um, and to, to kind of really be more consistent. I almost, I, I think I can, I can almost go in my Excel file and go back to where I started doing that. And immediately you see from more red trades and immediately more green trades start popping up just from the, just when the, you start seeing the notes in my Excel file, you really start to see the, the color scheme change from red yeah. to, to green, more green. So that was huge. Awesome. Right? Um, all right. So now, Okay, so we described 2016, 17, 18, I guess 19, maybe. And then so like all this was happening, you were basically preparing yourself for the big, the big COVID pandemic. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, it all aligns. So now how far along were you uh, before, you know, you were ready for all the opportunity or I guess, you know, you were thrown into it. So yeah. it all was like, you know, it came together. That That's a, that's a great, that's a great point because, um, 2019 really set me up well for 2020. And, and what I mean by that is so right between when I found the two setups I want to trade, which was OTC dip buying and, and OTC shorting. Um, I, I essentially only traded OTC. I mean, I dabbled and listed here and there, but I was like break even if maybe like a couple hundred bucks in profit. Um, I was not at all a listed experienced trader. Um, and in 2019, OTCs, at least the second half of 2019, OTCs practically like vanished. Um, the OTC did buy vanished. I mean, I thought it was gone forever. I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't, I had no idea whether I was going to ever trade a uh, buy a bounce again. Um, and so I quickly realized like I have to adapt in some manner. Uh, and so I quickly learned like I would adjust to, I would have to adjust the listed stocks, NASDAQ stocks. Um, and I would do it in a way that, you know, in OTC first red day, was really the setup that kind of grew into what I was shorting, you know, that, that led to that panic. Like I mentioned earlier, I learned NASDAQs also have a first red day. They're just a little bit different, right? They're a little bit more choppier. Um, it might take, require more patience. It might take better risk, risk management, um, just more experience leading, reading level two, just a whole, it's, it's still the same framework, but a different maybe skill set needed to be developed in reading price action. So um, for the next like second half of 2019 into 2020, I had really cultivated um, learning listed well. I wasn't it wasn't at all mastered at all, but I could at least by the end by the by the time, by the time December 2019 and came, 2019 came around, I was able to be consistently profitable shorting Nasdaq first red days. Um, it might have been sloppy. It wasn't it certainly wasn't as smooth as OTCs. My OTC profits were still way bigger on red days there than listed, um, but I at least gained some consistency. So it's so funny, like right. So then right when COVID hit. Um, Right, listed runners about finding the new best vaccine just exploded. I mean, we had like what yeah. 15, 20 at a time. It was it was nuts. Um, so it was it was really um, it's funny looking back how like the stars kind of aligned in that manner of like what was a slow market and difficult market market prepared me very well for when the that 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 COVID you know stimulus money started coming in um, and all these listed runners just going nuts. So that's that's really when Nasdaq trading started to become a more primary um, setup. Um, almost more so at least maybe 50, 50 OTC NASDAQ, but over time it's, it's slowly become more NASDAQ just because that's where the money is. Um, bigger money, I should say. And even right now being 2021, like this OTC market is very similar to what I saw back in 2019. Um, so most of a lot of my profits now are, are still listed more so. Um, listed. Okay. And then like earlier this year and the end of last year, all the OTCs were running. So like mm -hmm. all your OTC dip buying skills, came in handy. I guess, True. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. So, so the, and I think the reason why this, this second half of 2021, or at least this particular quarter of 2021 is so slow in the OTC world because yeah, in December, 2020, uh, January, 2021 and, tw and February. Yeah. I, I mean, we, I haven't seen a more insane OTC market in ever. Um, there was an article, I forget who it was by. And I just, I just showed this, share this article with, um, with someone it was like record volume being traded in the OTC market. Like it showed a monthly volume um, per shares and the OTC market right in December, 2020, I mean, it traded almost like a trillion shares between all of all the stocks in the OTC market, yeah, was which was like almost like four X the, the previous <laughs> high. Um, so just like, yeah, what, I don't know what caused that. I don't know what started that or what was the catalyst, but, but yeah, from December to February, we, I, I've never seen so many OTCs run and right. The, the dip by that panic dip by made me probably more money 
than any other setup in that time frame. So like, yeah, so to pull that full circle, like yeah, learning a setup that was originally my, my primary setup to then having it disappear for about a year or two um, comes back and I was still prepared and then I, I took huge advantage of it. So yeah, totally. Awesome. Okay. And then also like being in the challenge, fellow challenge member here, like I know that having a community is really good to fall mm-hmm. back on, you know, other, there's other traders like yourself and all that you can talk to. And also, like, even in Puerto Rico for myself, actually, since I moved to Puerto Rico, um, I've improved even more because, like, I have other s- successful traders around me. And, like, um, I know, like, Adam, there's a white diamond research. Adam, he's, he trades in the same office as me. And uh, he, he basically any f- questions I have with fundamentals, I ask him and, he, you know, and, and it's, I get straightforward. So like, you had a lot of uh, uh, benefit. You know, you got you got a lot of um you got a lot of the community as well. I think, you you know, you have a good relationship with Jack and Mari, you have the, the twist episodes now and all that. So how much did like a, being around the community of like-minded people help out with your trading and able to like, you know, dive into the OTC. I know like Jack is a master of OTC. So like how mm-hmm. much did that help your, you know, your trading? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, huge, huge. Um, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily any one, person. I mean, Jack was definitely a huge help for me. Um, but I, I've also got another reason why the only reason I say that is just because I know a lot of people have, a lot of traders have reached out to me before. Like they're, 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 they're confusing a community with like a, a mentor, like a personal mentor. Um, and yeah, a personal mentor, like one-on-one is great and it certainly would help, but I think some people mistaken like that, like they need that or else it's not going to happen. And I think the community is more like a smaller or a larger group of like, right. Like-minded traders that help you. And so back when first me and Jack came in contact with each other, we were only both up about like 30 grand in profits or so and both in the challenge. Um, and it wasn't just him. We, we immediately found other, other traders who were kind of like, they weren't, they hadn't quote unquote made it yet big, but they were, they were, they were four or five figure profit students. They were, they had gotten, they'd realized their strategy, but they, but we needed, um, you know, maybe more a middle ground, a middle ground growth from coming from, just profitable, but not like doing it for a living yet. Um, and so, so yeah, Jack definitely, definitely helped me on my long game in terms of OTCs. Um, but even now my, my, me going long on OTCs is not nearly as good as, as his, or, um, I need a, I need a good market to go long. Otherwise I'll be unprofitable. Um, but, um, in terms of the community, yeah, you just gotta, you gotta find, you can't force it. You know, you can't force yourself upon somebody else and be like, you know, teach me or like, you know, like yeah. be my friend. Um, it just, it, it, was, <laughs> yeah. it was so natural when, when, when me and Jack approach each other and we didn't, we, we had no idea we were going to be this close years later. It was just kind of like, Oh, you're up around the same amount of money. I am. We seem to have somewhat similar strategies. We, we appreciate, you know, he wanted to learn short selling and I wanted to learn longing. So we kind of shared ideas off each other. Um, and it just grew to this thing. It, we, you know, if you told me like this was going to be one of your closest guy friends in this trading community, like I'd have been like, oh, sure, I don't know, you know. Um, it just it was like how life works with friends. Like you never really know who your best friend is when you first meet him, and it just turns into something bigger. So you know, if you find like minded traders that are in your same, maybe in your same town or um, similar strategies, like kind of be befriending them, but just just almost building that community yourself and just being friendly and talking to people can always, can never, can never hurt. I don't think it always can help. You never know who you're going to meet. So for sure. You know, uh, I was watching Jack Schwarzy. That, so you're talking about Jack, Jack Kellogg. So there's also right. Jack Schwarzy. He was dressing up as the elf this year, going to the <laughs> animal shelters. So you were the yeah. elf last year. I was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I we <laughs> surprised, we surprised Jack last year, Jack yeah. Kellogg last yeah. year. Yeah. That was funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember. All right. So, so, okay. So now, now about like how you trade nowadays uh, more. So, okay. So how would you describe yourself as a trader, like discretionary, systematic, like how, how rules based are you? How much rules? Cause you were mentioning like tight risk, like uh, risk reward ratio, whatever. So how much of into the rules do you, you know, do you go into? Right. Right. Um, so I'm definitely discretionary, very, very on the discretionary side. There's no any algo or, 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 um, Indi- hardcore indicators that I find are coding. I don't do any of that. Um, so very, very discretionary. But in terms of being discretionary, yeah, I am very um, rule-based. I am very um, risk management-based. Um, yeah, there's, there is some, I don't want to say the word, like the, the feel of it. There are some, there is some feel to it. 
but I'm very strict in the sense that like, if it's not a setup I trade, right. If, if, if I'm looking at a stock and it doesn't have, you know, X, Y, and Z of criteria that show me this setup is going to happen. I don't take it. I'm very strict in that sense. Um, this, you know, when I say feel, I mean, feel in the trade itself. Once the setup, I'm never the trader who can just be like, you know what, I'm going to trade Apple today and just start buying dips and short and tops. Like I, I will, I will fall over myself hundreds of times trying to do that. Um, so even though I'm discretionary, I'm very strict in like, if it's not, you know, these list of setups that I trade, I don't trade it just period. Like it has to have so X, Y, and Z of criteria. Once I see that, then I say, okay, you know, how much do I want to risk? Where is my risk? Where's my stop? Where's my entry? Um, that gives me my position size and I'll take the trade and I'll let the trade work from there. Um, so, so yeah, that's how, that's how I would say it. That's how I'd put it. Awesome. And how long does it take you to get in, like go through the process to get into the trade? Um, so I think, so I guess to, to kind of answer two questions here, like this, I think that's why I've, I've prepared or I, I've, I've leaned towards and like short selling more because I kind of get more time to prepare myself, right? Like if, if there's a long trade and you have the long, like the first green day, you got to be quick. You got to realize like there's news, this good news, and it's going to go. And if you don't, if you don't buy it quickly, like you kind of miss it, or at least the, the biggest part of the move. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at spotting momentum quickly. I'm better at seeing momentum, seeing it be up for two or three days in a row. And now I can prepare the night before for say 30 minutes at most to an hour um, and just see it. Okay. This stock has a lot of the indicators I want to see for a first red day. You know, if it does any of these scenarios out the morning, then I want to get short. So I'm kind of already mentally prepared for the night before. So then coming into the morning, you know, I, I all I have to do is pretty much once I see what I want to see, quickly calculate my position size. So like if, if I want to short a stock at like five bucks, my risk is say five, 525, you know, it's 15 cents. I'll say I want to risk uh, $2,500. So I'll take, I'll take 10 K shares there, you know, 10, 20, or 25 cents on the 10 K shares. That'll be 2,500 bucks if I stop out. Um, so I, then I just enter the trade of that entry and then I either, it either works on a first red day or it doesn't. Um, so besides that math, um, everything else is pretty much prepared and thought through, um, the night before, maybe pre-market at the latest. Um, but it's, it's kind of all, it's all pre-planned, pre-planned out. So. Great. Uh, and what's your favorite setup? Is it the, the first red day? Like you describe or. You know- yeah. Yeah. I would say if I, I had, unfortunately I haven't, I've been, I've been slacking on tracking like setups over, over my career. I kind of stopped back in, in 2020, but if I, if I can go, if I can collect all the data of all my setups, first red day is by far my, my most profitable for sure. Uh, so, okay. So you, you track less now and like, you know, like I had a newbie the other day, like I preach about journaling and everything in the office in Puerto Rico. And then like, um, He's like, oh, yeah, I don't see you journal that much, man. <laughs> I was like, ah, it's been, you know, I kind of earned the right not to, like, I have other things to focus on now. So, like, how did you go about, okay, now I don't need to focus so much on that. Let me uh, track in the setup. I kind of understand it already. When was, like, the point where, you know, you decided to, lay, you know, to switch it up from that? Right. Yeah. I, I've noticed that theme as well. Like, a lot of traders, you go from, it goes from being so front end loaded from studying to tracking to journaling. Like it's so much time in the beginning. And then, right. There's, there's kind of like this phase and I think it's different for everybody. Um, and for me, it was probably between year three, year four, where I, I, it went from, it went from me perfecting my strategy to then just, just perfecting and refining it to then just maintaining it. Like, and by maintaining, I don't mean that I wasn't making bigger profits, but I kind of had nailed it on the head where like, okay, this works. I like how I do, I'm doing this. Now it's just about, uh, now it's more about seeing what market environment we're in, right? Or seeing like, how is my strategy working in this particular environment? Or should I be more aggressive? Should I be, should I be pulling back on size? So now it's, it's a lot more of just reflecting on current trades um, and, and how the market environment is particularly affecting that versus me trying to, you know, yeah, track a new setup or even track current setups in a way like, and, and for me, my tracking, my current setups is just me putting in my, my trade. So like, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I have to trade or track every single first red day, even if I miss it or not, the ones I take, I just like to know how did I trade it? Did I trade it well? Did I trade it poorly? Like I, I still do do the, the tracking of, of, you know, what I did right, what I did wrong and what can I continue and, and, and do better. Um, but right in terms of like, 
finding out that first red day still works 67.5% of the time. And, you know, yeah, it's all, it's all maintenance now. It's not so much discovery or, 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 or perfecting. It's more maintaining and just um, continually adapting to what market environment we're in. Absolutely. Um, and are, are you looking as part of your process for entering a trade? Are you looking at like dilution or do you not float short, like a certain float size? You know, if it's too small of a float, like I know, like, for example, a lot of these first red days uh, that I've seen, the good ones have been like ultra low floats. And I, just, I, I just don't like those. Yeah. <laughs> like LGVN yeah. as like, just oh, keeps, man, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I, I, I don't have any hard set rule on float. Um, but the longer I've traded, the more I've just, I just do not want to touch stocks under like under five, you know, under two is like, no. And LGVN was my, my most recent reminder. I, I had an unfortunate loss on that, that one day, that top day. And I not only, and I didn't lose money or I lost money on shorting it, but I also lost money trying to long it, like trying to thought I was smart and better than the stock. Um, so that was, that was a huge reminder for me. Like, yeah, no, anything under 2 million. It just, it is, it's never, I've never found it to be worth it for me, you know, like, um, if I could, you know, in many ways, like back to the, the stats question, like I don't almost, I almost don't even need to know it to go back in my stats and or my journal and find out how many stocks I've made money on under $2 million or 2 million float. It's like, I just know, I'm like, I can't think of a trade where a stock's been a 2 million or 2 million share float and I've just crushed it. Or it's been like such this big part of my strategy. It's like not, if anything, it hurts me. Um, so yeah, under 2 million, I, I don't, I have no desire to trade anymore um, at all. Under five, I mean, maybe, maybe if I'm seeing something absolutely ideal, I'll take, but really anything over, as you start entering the 10, 20, 30 million, 40 million floating up, the more I start to like it more and more and more, especially if it has a lot of volume um, from, from just the, the, the liquidity standpoint. Um, yeah. So float there, that's float there. Um, was there, was there a second part of the question or was it float or no dilution? Oh, the right? float and dilution. Dilution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so dilution, I won't look that, that closely, you know, if I say I find a, a first red day potential or a potential first red day coming up, I won't necessarily search their filings right away to find dilution just because it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it is, it's a slippery slope where a stock might have dilution, but if they don't use it, you know, you're kind of, you can, it's very, I've found it very easy to get caught up in the fact like, but they're dilutive. Like I should short it anyway, you know, versus listening to the price action and being like, whether they're dilutive or not, a first red day statistically should still happen, or this should, this should happen. And then it should look this way. Um, so there are some instances where I, I happen to maybe hear from a, 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 someone else in the community saying, yeah, this stock's dilutive for X, Y, and Z reasons. I might then do my own due diligence and not just go off someone's word um, and, and find out for myself. And then, then I'll know. Um, but in terms of finding dilution on a stock and then that changing how I trade it, um, not the case really. It's more of, of, I still want to see, you know, these indicators play out. I still want to treat it as a first red day. Maybe I'll be more aggressive. Like maybe, um, for example, like the one, one way I, I'll come across dilution myself is if I'm already watching a stock that's running and they put out an offering and it's like an ATM offering. So where the ATM offering is my favorite because they can kind of sell at any price they want. There's not like a, a direct offering price. And so if that's the case, then I will do the due diligence of like, okay, how much, how much is the offering? How many shares does that mean they can sell? How big is the volume in, com in comparison to how much they can sell? Because if they're trading, if the stock's trading hundred million shares a day and the, and the ATM is only 4 million shares, you know, there's too much volume in the day to, to really affect that, that for the dilution to affect that stock. So th that's the due diligence I will do if I find an ATM um, on a stock I'm already watching. Um, but besides that, I'm not really looking at dilution on a daily basis or checking every stock I find. It's really kind of a opportunistic thing. Like if I find something has to do with do or a stock has to do has to do with dilution, then I'll look. But otherwise, I'm still trading the price action. I'm still looking for um, a first red day, regardless if there's dilution or not. So the first red day. So for example, so I know I, I remember you you mentioning you traded like AMC or maybe GME or something. So. Were you doing first red days? Were you looking for first red days when those things were going wild? Yeah, yeah. Specific, yeah, specific. I mean, GME was way tougher because it was, I mean, that was the most insane mania I've seen where like celebrities were, were which were tweeting about it and stuff. Yeah. So I was like, oh, this is nuts. And I remember how GME happened. It wasn't even, it wasn't in my like, my framework of how I understand my personal first red days because there's a lot of first red days that happen, but there's only certain ways that they happen that I can predict 
maybe relatively straightforward, you know, or, or I wouldn't say easily, but I can understand them. Some red days to happen. I'm like, Oh, I, I had no idea that I didn't see that coming. Um, GME was more on the side of like, I didn't see that coming in terms of when it happened. Um, and also I think like every broker restricted it. So I didn't even, I'm, I had no FOMO missing it. Cause I don't think I could even short it anyway, but AMC was much more, much more my style. Um, I think that, I think that particular day was an overextended gap down, which is like Tony's favorite type of red day, um, which I, I do trade. I just consider it a type of red day or a, a type of entry different than a particular red day that I like. Like normally I like red days where I can short them going red for the first time. Whereas overextended gap and they're kind of already gapping down and opening red for the first time. So you kind of have to try to get short into a spike. And I think that was AMC's particular scenario. Um, but yeah, still, still same framework in my mind of, of this is how it should play in the morning. Um, and I think it did that it sold off, you know, 15, 20% in the first hour or two, which is the, my, usually my sweet spot. Um, and, and yeah, so that's how that worked out. Awesome. Okay. So, so with these first red days, like AMC, you'll come up with a thesis before the market open of how it should play out. And then like, what, what is the main indicator? Like, would you short into like the initial panic after a certain percentage, or are you looking for certain factors or indicators? Like what, what is the criteria for you to meet? Like, okay, this is a red day before it flips around. Um, So, so for me, at least on the front side, I I like stocks that are at least up a hundred percent. That's not a hard rule because um, there have been stocks I'll short that are only up 80 or stocks that are up 200, 300. Essentially, the high, the more extended, the better, just from a general perspective. Um, I think AMC was up, what, from 13 or 15 up to like 60. So yeah. it was plenty extended. Um, it had the mania aspect of it. Like, again, even and again, even and some some reasons why I might short something that's not up over 100 percent. If there's still like this over hype ish. Um, sentiment about it, right? If there's like this this overdone buying or overdone um, just perspective from like the market participants, then I know there's it's like a mini bubble. You know, there's a there's the there's this euphoria that can't last, and once it's over, if you can find when it's over in the price action or see it in the price action, um, that's a great leading indicator for for a red day. So something like. Um, I guess there's two examples. One is right. One is either if it gaps down, and if it gaps down, is it the first time it's gapped down? So there's there's so many like idiosyncrasies. But like, if a stock has never gapped down in its run up, and this is its first time gapping down, I have to now I have to trust the odds that a red day is coming. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes stocks do end up going back green, and that's when I would cut it. Um, but just from a standpoint of like, if it's gone three, four days in a row and every single day it's gapped up. And on the fifth day, it's gapping down right out the open. I have to assume statistically speaking, it's going to have a red day. Um, but then you have to look at things like, is it gapping down too big, right? If a stock is open down 20%, well, that's kind of like the red day I wanted. I would have loved to be short from red green and covered down 20%, not entered down 20%. So yeah. you have to really, you know, <laughs> gain that experience of like, okay, is this a stock I want to short to a spike? Um, is this a stock only gapping down 5%? And that's, I don't need a spike. I want to, I want to get short out of the open because it could still panic 10%. Um, sometimes do I want to risk above red green? Cause there's a, a meaningful risk level from yesterday's price action and red green isn't really that, that meaningful. Um, all these little things, but that's essentially kind of the gist of, of a gap down strategy, um, which isn't my necessarily favorite. Cause again, I'm not a fan of, of trying to short into a spike. Cause in many ways you end up being, it's very easy to be full size on a, on a, on a, on a loss because you keep adding to a strength. And then once you're full size, if it, the stock's too strong, you end up just stopping out because it actually ends up going green. Um, versus if a stock kind of is super weak and you only put on a starter and then it works, it's like, ah, I only have starter size. So um, that's de- definitely always been a struggle for, for gap downs, um, for overextending gap downs. My favorite type of red day is like a gap up. And, and these are more difficult because sometimes, right, if a st- same scenario, let's say a stock's gone up three, four days in a row and it's gapped, ever, gapped up every day. Well, what makes this, and say on the fifth day, it's gapping up. Well, how, how on earth do I know, right, it's going to be a red day? It just, it's gapping up like it always has. Um, some things I'll look for, and I, I learned this from, um, from Stephen Ducks, is looking for like a huge momentum shift. So, so say like, you know, every one of those days, it's, it's had a morning spike, but it's held its morning spike and then like consolidated and went higher. If on the fifth day, it has this huge morning spike, massive volume, but fails. I mean, gives up in its entire morning spike, but it's still up, say 10% of the day. It like spiked up to 20%, cr- got crushed and lost all its morning spike gains, but it's still green on the day. 
that would be enough of, of, a, of an indicator for me to be like, okay, this is a momentum shift. It hasn't done this before, you know, it's, and it's almost similar to the gap down. I'm looking for something different. I'm looking, you know, the gap down on an overextended gap down strategy is the momentum shift because it's the first gap down and it's opening red. That like huge morning spike and then fail is also a different shift because if all the previous days it's held the morning spike, now it's different. Um, especially if it say it tries to spike again, it has like a, a higher low or a, a lower high, I should say, and then fails again. Um, you know, I use view app. If it starts failing under view app, starts making a new morning low, all these things kind of start to align themselves. I'm like, okay, it's not red yet, but it's giving me enough to work with. Like it's worth it. I, I'm okay with taking a risk and, and putting these odds in my favor or letting these odds play out. Um, I guessing they're in my favor. And I will, I will end up taking a short into like a new morning low a day or on to, or into, if I want to take a starter and be aggressive into that, um, into that lower high or into that view app stuff. Um, all these different types of slowly entries, like, and like I said, like scaling in and out over PDT, that's one way I'll do it. Like I'll start in on, you know, the first lower high I'll scale in once we start failing view app. And then I might be full size by the time we make a new morning low. Um, and if we haven't paying too much, maybe I'll add on a red green. Like, right? so all these little areas are like, as the indicators keep piling on, I might continually start adding more and more in size. And then once all of them come together, by that time, it's probably red in the day and I'll be full size and I'll, I'll let it, let it work from there. Wow. That's pretty, pretty, pretty uh, well said right there. Cool. Thanks, Thanks for that. Good, good. <laughs> um, I'm going to go over that a few times myself. Um, okay. So what's, what's your most memorable ticker? Most memorable trade? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I, mean, I guess my most profitable ticker is AMC. But I wouldn't say that's the most memorable because it was as, as much money as I made on it. It was also quite a pain in the butt many times. Um, the one ticker that comes to mind was LCDX. Um, LCDX was an OTC. And this was when around, this only happened maybe two or three times in my career, but there was a trend where, um, do you remember, do you remember Signal? S-G-S-I-G-L? Um, it, was a com- it was a company that, that Elon Musk tweeted about. He tweeted about like something signal, something about a company named Signal. There was an OTC named Signal Inc. Oh yeah, I remember this. Completely different companies, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that was that was a play that I didn't get to trade very much because I just didn't have borrows and it was it was I think it was low floats, so it was very difficult to trade. Um, however, LCDX was Lucid Inc. All right, and this is when Lucid Motors, which is now LCID, but back then it was still a SPAC. Um, was becoming, was turning into the market, like electric vehicle stock, hype-ish, very, very, um, you know, the next Tesla vibe, very, very euphoric. Um, and so everyone wanted to get on on that. The problem is, right, Lucid Inc. isn't Lucid Motors. There were two completely different companies. So this LCDX stock totally, like, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't think the CEOs ever said anything, um, but they're, they just, uh, enough momentum got around in the stock that people started thinking that this was lucid motors Yeah, and it was lucid ink. It was a complete, I don't think they were even an electric vehicle company. They were completely different. Um, and so it got to the point where I think the stock ran from like one to six bucks in like two or three days. Um, and, wow. and I got lucky with timing and that they put out a PR midday saying like, we are not lucid motors. Like we, <laughs> we, this is, this is all wrong. And, um, this is also around the time when um, OTC markets would, they would put the um, the skull and crossbones. So if you go to like the OTC markets.com and any, any ticker you type in, they will give you like a, a little like breakdown of what the stock is, whether it's like a verified account, um, verified stock, like has, or as uh, up to date on their filings. Um, it's a, if it's a pink sheet, it's a, if it's a gray sheet and the, the worst symbol they or the worst kind of rating they can get is if it's a skull and crossbones, which is like buyer beware, this stock is scammy. This is like a shell company. This is a, this is, you don't want to buy this. Like this is worthless. So because the company got like, admitted, at least good on their part, they were like, yeah, we're not lucid motors. OTC markets like midday, which they never do. They usually always do it after hours or pre-market midday. They slapped it with saying like, buyer beware, do not buy this. And so when the stock gets that just from previous experience, like the stock usually sells off like 80, 90% just gets crushed. Um, And I was, I mean, this happened midday. Like I literally now had an opportunity to see this thing at like five mid, 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 mid fives come out and say that this whole run up, it's been up from the ones is like not legitimate. It got the worst rating by OTC markets that you can get. So I quickly went to, to go find borrows 
Um, and at the time, this is when I, again, this is when I got started getting really close with Jack Kellogg. We both saw there were like only like 10 K of ours left. So we each split up. We took each took 5k. We shorted it. And I mean, yeah. this, we just proceeded to watch this thing just dump. Like in a matter of two or three hours, it went from 550 down to like sub two. And I think I covered like high ones. Um, and then the next day it was like almost sub one. So I even covered too early, but it was, it was really cool. Just watching this thing just get crushed for, for over two hours and just nonstop selling. And, and, and it was, it was a sight to see. It was very, very That's cool. That's crazy. So, Did you have to call yeah. the broker to close it out? Cause it was in the gray sheets or skull and bones. Uh, great point. Yeah. I was, so luckily I was, yeah, I, I found, I kind of caught, caught wind of the news quickly enough to where I was able to enter the trade. But after about 30 minutes into the trade, right. The brokers like stop. Oh, yeah. When you get the, when you get the, yeah. when you get that buyer beware, most brokers will stop you trading it. So I was already short. So the broker's like, okay, we'll let you stay short. You just can't enter anymore, which was fine because I, I couldn't get any more borrowed anyway. Um, but yeah, so then the, the, that day, later in the late day, as we were into the close, I had to call them and be like, put my order at like one, I think I put it like 170, 180, just to, just so I can, you know, get yeah. it into the panic. And, it, and it, I filled and that was it. So, yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, wow. Okay, so next question. Uh, we're going to wrap it up soon. So, do you trade crypto? I know you mentioned some crypto in the past. Um, I'm very, I don't trade it short term. I'm very uh, long term, long, long almost term. like I, and I, I kind of, like, I've taken that approach because I just couldn't imagine trying to trade it and, and lose sleep. <laughs> like if I see an opportunity, it's like two in the morning. The last thing I want to do is, is get up and then be attached to the screens and, um, you know, have it take away from my stock trading. So I've, I've adapted and, and, and I've accepted it being a long term thing. Yeah. Long term, so you just like average, uh, like what is it, what is it dollar cost average? You just like buying a whole um, forever? Not so much. I'm I'm pretty much full. How much I how much I want to allocate towards it by now? But I've always judged a buy into to over time and into to, you know the 30 percent dips that crypto usually has. Um, I like buying projects that I think are like actually solve real real world problems. Yeah. Um, so that in you know a good five ten year hold, like they will be ideally and more in value, right? Some have gone, some have gone down. Like I haven't all, all these ticker or all these cryptos I've bought haven't worked out well. Um, but the ones that do work out well end up, you know, you know, you've seen, I'm sure you've seen crypto, like when they work, they work really well and you see these yeah. thousands of percent winners. So um, I have almost, it's like, I have a portfolio of them and I like to just pick the ideas. And once I buy them, I forget about them. Like let it, let them go for five years and see where they turn out. Um, that's kind of how I like to look at it. Cool. So, okay. So you have like a, a trading chat room or something like that. So you got the challenge going, then you have one on the, on the side, right? Yeah. So, so, um, I, so I guess, I don't know when it was, it was earlier this year, um, stocks to trade approached me and Jack and said, Hey, do you guys want like to have your own, start your own community, right? You both learned from the challenge. Do you want to like kind of start your own thing? And I said, and we said, okay, like, yeah, let's see, let's see what it's about. So we, we ended up starting this chat room through stocks to trade called break and breakdowns. Um, and then Mari joined it later on, um, I believe uh, a few months after we started, so it's just us three as the moderators in that room. Um, we'll alert our trades. We do about one webinar every two weeks. Um, we put out watch lists. Um, again, we'll alert our trade, not alert, but we'll we'll talk about our trades in real time, why we're taking it, what's our entry, um, what setup it is, um, the tickers we're watching. So we try to we've tried to build this room into like a little community of of, of just how we trade and we want to help people. You know, it's the same way Tim helped everyone in the challenge who stuck with it. Like we want to. Do the same for people who want to join our room. So that's what we've been we've been up to. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try it out soon. Um, yeah, totally. All right, so for sure. So where do you see yourself in the future with trading? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I love trading enough to where I, I definitely don't see myself, or I definitely do see myself trading for the next 10, 20 years. I mean, who knows what trading will be back then? Who knows what we're? Who knows what the stock market will become? You know, in that time. But um, I definitely love it enough where. Even if it's not trading, like investing, I love I love managing money and and finding ideas and whether it being a trade or an investment, um, it's definitely what I want to do very very long term for the most majority of my life, unless something just pops up out of nowhere. But right now, this is the goal or the focus. Um, specifically in trading, I mean, I, I just want to keep getting bigger. Um, you know, at some point, I, I you know, there's only a few plays a year that come around where, you know, if you push size. Um, you can make a, a windfall of money, like almost one trade a year and you're done. And I, and I don't say that because I want to stop trading. Like I, I, I like trading throughout the year, but there's a level of like, besides the money, there's a level of mastery that comes with like really pushing it when you get like that kind of black swan kind of a play once a year or twice a year. Um, 
So for me, I think a big goal of mine is to like keep growing my account or my accounts big enough to where when I do get those A plus like once a year opportunities, I really can push it. Um, other than that, just keep living it day to day and, and taking the trades I think are worth it and, and growing my, just making money trading, um, teaching people as well. And, um, and yeah, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Awesome. Um, all right. Any book recommendations? Um, all the market wizards. I'm sure because you had, you tell you said you had uh, Swagger. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Swagger on. Um, yeah. Love all his, even the new one, the, what's called, not the modern. Unknown, um, the unknown market wizards. Unknown. Yeah, that one is really, really good. Um, all of his books. Uh, I love all of Dr. Brett Steendarger's books. I, I mentioned the Daily Trading Coach earlier, but he has um, Trading Psychology, Trading Psychology 2.0. Um, those are really great. Um, I also like uh, any book by um, Dr. Van K. Tharp, very similar oh, okay. to uh, Brett Steenbarger, but it takes a little bit different approach. He almost takes like a, a business approach to trading, like literally writing down, like, what is your strategy? What does it mean? And like, almost like putting up a business plan. That was huge for me. Um, so yeah, those three authors, any of those books of those three authors are really, really good. Awesome. I'll have those in the show notes. All right, cool. Kyle, that about wraps it up. Um, thanks for taking the time out to come on, man. I really appreciate it. And pretty yeah. sure everybody will. Totally. Totally. Thanks for having me on. This is, this is fun. Absolutely, man. Well, you have a great rest of your day and I will see you in the chat room soon. Sounds good. Later.